We are live. A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 303, Ocular Oncology Module Number 10. Today we have with us Dr. Vikas Menon from Arvind Eye Hospital, Chennai, talking to us on malignant tumors of the eyelid. Uh, sir has done his DNB in ophthalmology from Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, and then went on to do his fellowship in ophthalmic plastic surgery, orbital surgery, and ocular oncology from the prestigious LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. From 2008 to 2021, he was the consultant in the Department of uh, Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery and Oncology at Center for Sight, New Delhi, and has recently made, made the shift to Arvind Eye Hospital, Chennai, where he is uh, presently the senior consultant of the department. Uh, sir has 32 publications to his credit, including peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals and chapters in textbooks. And Sir is a reviewer of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, Delhi Journal of Ophthalmology, and OPRS Journal. So a uh, very warm welcome to you, sir. We are happy and glad to have you here and uh, looking forward to your lecture. Over to you. Thank you, Shefali. Thank you, Rolika. Thank you, Dr. Hanauer and uh, Team Center for Sight for Eye Focus. It's always a pleasure to be part of Eye Focus. We've been with Eye Focus since the beginning, mm -hmm. the first uh, session of Eye Focus. So, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So, basically, I'll be talking about basic stuff, talking about concepts and principles. And uh, since Eye Focus is mainly targeted towards uh, postgraduates, so I'll be talking relevant stuff. Stuff uh, which I I wish I knew when I was doing my post graduation, as well as uh, some questions which I had at that point of time, and we didn't have this kind of technology or or these kinds of sessions back then. And uh, I would welcome any uh, questions if anybody who's in the audience has to ask. So uh, I think Dr. Pairu started the eyelid tumor session, and. Uh, we all know that eyelid tumors can arise from any of these uh, structures, epidermal structures, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, hair follicles, melanocytic. Now, a lot, many of these uh, structures can give rise to tumors which can be benign, as well as uh, some of them can give rise to tumors which turn malignant also. And then uh, lymphoid tumors and metastatic tumors uh, usually are secondary to the eyelid, not primary. Lymphoid tumors usually are associated with an orbital uh, origin and then they secondarily invade the eyelid. Metastatic obviously as the name suggests uh, arise somewhere else and they find their secondary home in eyelid. So these are all some of the common uh, things that we see in our OPD and I'm sure Dr. Fairuz would have talked in much detail about all of these lesions. These are benign lesions which commonly we keep seeing day in and day out in our OPDs and <clears throat> And sometimes in busy OPDs, we, we, we tend to, uh, we can, there's always a potential to miss something like this. So what happened here was uh, this patient, an elderly patient, as you can see from her eyelid skin also, there's a lot of laxity and all those age-related changes which you can see. So, so this person, this patient presented with a, a Calaisian type uh, lesion on the eyelid, patient was posted for cataract surgery and before in the pre-operative uh, workup, somebody noticed chalazion and sent to our department uh, to remove chalazion and so that they could do cataract surgery subsequently. Uh, but there was something atypical about uh, this swelling on the lid. Now, as we see this patient and a couple of uh, next patients, we will start seeing some things which are common. A, a pattern will emerge, some common features that all of these malignancies share which will help you all to identify these lesions at an early stage and also clinically help you to differentiate uh, benign lesions from the malignant ones in your OPD on your slit lamp examination itself many of the times. And uh, those suspicious lesions or those clinically uh, suspicious malignant lesions, you need to treat differently than rather than going in blindly like a, a, a calaisian or something similar. Now, it's easily one can miss, but uh, a few things which I would uh, suggest uh, you notice in this uh, uh, patient are that everywhere else, the cilia are fine, but particularly over the, over the lesion, you see that there is paucity of cilia. Some eyelashes are missing. And uh, this is a, a picture of the lid margin at that area. 
so you see this this was a solid mass and it looks like you know something which is having lot of vessels in the substance of the lesion it's trying to pop out of the lid margin it's growing inside the lid uh, tarsal plate probably and it's trying to pop out of the lid margin like this so you can see the prominent vessels there you can see the eyelashes being less and you can see that in that particular area you cannot make out uh, the normal orientation of the meibomian orifices right so these are some of these things which keep in mind and we'll see how a pattern emerges as we go through few more cases now this patient because of this atypical appearance uh, was taken up for biopsy where oil red o stain came positive and atypical cells were present so this case was then diagnosed as a sebaceous gland carcinoma rather than a kelage and then treated appropriately another elderly man came with a small kelagion type was referred as a kelagion only and he was referred for this small swelling which he was saying that it is growing for the last 6 months in my eyelid it started as a very small pimple but then now it is growing and it is becoming harder so on a closer look again what you will appreciate here is that there is some loss of eyelashes you can see some feeder vessels or prominent vessels on the eyelid margin you see a yellowish colored solid kind of a firm kind of a mass which is uh, involving the eyelid margin and part of the tarsal plate and uh, this is not looking like a normal kind of a kelagion it is extending if it is a kelagion you know it is extending and involving the eyelid margin trying to come out of it having lots of abnormal vessels so something suspicious is there agreed another uh, angle to look at the same thing so you see lots of vessels a solid looking yellowish mass sparsity of flashes so these two three things we note in this case also patient was biopsy turned out sebaceous gland carcinoma another patient similar to kelagion so many times kelagion is a common thing in your opd you will see many cases of kelagion in a single day in your opd but another patient who came with a similar thing presented referred to us as kelagion to our department but you see the prominent vessels red blood vessels look at the lid margin there are no obvious meibomian orifices there are no eyelashes at all in that area and it's a solid kind of a solid firm feel of the mass so this should prompt you to think on a different line and not subject the patient to a blind incision and curettage just like that and throw away the material that would be a blunder in this kind of situation another patient a farmer by profession came with history of you know blood coming out of his eye with this swelling on the eyelid and uh, somebody from the general opd referred as uh, you know maybe possibly some foreign body because he was giving a history of working in the agricultural sector and he is a farmer and all those things that there could be a foreign body impacted in the lid or something and uh, but uh, the moment i averted the lid this is what i found it was a diffuse large kind of a mass papilliform mass involving a large section of the tarsal conjunctiva arising from the tarsus with prominent feeder vessels with areas of bleed so you know this again is not a usual foreign body reaction or some granuloma it's a solid mass which is more diffuse so you know this is something else you could be dealing with a malignancy here you have to be very cautious another patient presenting with a mass on the upper eyelid well defined mass yellowish in color lying there for a few months patient didn't bother about it but it is growing in size you see the eyelashes are gone over that area and it's a well defined mass over there you know it could be something malignant so when something like this comes you you've seen a few of these examples now and another one uh, you will see the common features here so the mass is extending beyond the tarsus is trying to burst out of the lid margin and uh, on a version there is this yellowish nodule kind of a thing with prominent blood vessels in the lesion so when you have a situation like this you are now seeing a particular pattern which is emerging out of all these cases is that you have a situation where there is a yellowish clump or a mass which has lots of prominent blood vessels and where the eyelashes can be sparse and the eyelid margin architecture is not like a normal usual Uh, uniform pattern of meibomian openings seen so in all these cases suspect it could be a malignancy and proceed cautiously 
uh, as per the protocols that we will discuss subsequently. Another patient with a small lid cyst referred as a lid uh, epidermoid cyst on the margin. But look at it. On slight diversion, the picture is something else. Other thing is always evert. Always evert and see. Even if there is a simple chalazion which is sent to you or you are posting for surgery, always evert and see. You never know what lies underneath. Particularly at extremes of ages, all these changes, malignant changes become common. So you have to be very, very careful and not miss out on something like this, which can really change the uh, patient's life altogether. Now, this case is interesting. This lady was roaming around for many months, gone to many ophthalmologists, diagnosed as a blepharoconjunctivitis of the left eye for a long time, edema, swelling, not subsiding, not subsiding. I tried all sorts of ointments, meboom, uh, all sorts of hot fermentation, then whatnot, everything, doxycycline was given. And here's a closer look at the lid. So what do you see here? Can anybody say, point out what all findings are visible here? Shefali, can you unmute so, and... There's a very obvious loss of cilia. Uh, there's mm. loss of meboomium gland architecture. There's mm. stylosis, that is thickening of the lid. There is erythema. Uh, mm -hmm. I see even keratin there. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so outside if we evert. So, it's uh, a, so there's a diffuse involvement of the eyelid, eyelid. from medial cancers to the lateral cancers. And uh, the eyelid marginal architecture is totally distorted. Uh, a significant loss of cilia. So a lot of uh, uh, red flags over there in our patient. Yes. And uh, given a history that she's been on and off, lot of treatment, everything else has been tried. So what comes to your mind in, when you see such a diffuse thing? So it can be a, a pagetoid spread. I will keep Exactly, that. exactly. So that is one variant of sebaceous gland carcinoma, which everyone must be aware of. And it is not that uncommon also. No. You see, uh, we've been seeing uh, cases of pagetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma frequently in our practice. And uh, so you see this spreads Along the, uh, along the superficial layers and grows on the surface. We'll talk about how to manage uh, these cases also. Uh, management is slightly different because these tend to uh, go into the conjunctiva as well and involve the ocular surface as well. There can be skip lesions also. The management protocol will change slightly in a patient with a pagetoid uh, spread. And your pathologist, if you do a biopsy here, will be able to clearly tell you that the sebaceous and carcinoma sample that you are sending is without pagetoid invasion or with pagetoid invasion. The pathologist will be able to tell you here. Now, another patient presented with a, a, a lumpy kind of a thing, lumpy kind of a mass along the lateral part of the upper eyelid with some pigmentation and uh, again, loss of eyelashes. So all these common features are there. You have loss of eyelashes, you have thickening of the eyelid margin, you have, uh, you have distortion of the lid margin architecture. All these point towards the uh, possibility of an underlying malignancy. So this was basically not a sebaceous and carcinoma, but a basal cell carcinoma. That's the other uh, common type of eyelid malignancy that we see. In India, most common remains the sebaceous and carcinoma, and the second most common would be basal cell carcinoma. Another patient who was referred to us as a skin molluscum, as a small lesion uh, with some induration or some elevation, and thickening on the lower eyelid of an elderly patient. So you see something like this. So what you typically, the term you use for this kind of a lesion is a, a lesion with a with rolled edges. It's a solid lesion, it's not like a molluscum, which is very very superficial, small lesion. Uh, uh, this is a solid lesion, and uh, with rolled edges and central ulceration at some time. So you will see different different forms of basal cell carcinoma. Also, basal cell carcinoma also is not a something which will always present here uniformly. Yeah, so you must keep your eyes and your mind open to the possibility of different presentation of these common malignancies, at least sebaceous gland carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. Never miss out on these. Uh, sorry for the blurred image. This was much before the iPhones and better phones cameras came around. And so this was uh, one patient which I saw many years back and patient presented with some ulceration of the lower lid margin and uh, a solid, a lot of erythema around the lesion, but but the skin around this, uh, around all this, this red area, this underneath the skin looked placoid and thick. 
the patient was being treated for ulcerative blepharitis for a long time. Now, the thing is, whenever you have a diagnosis of blepharitis in an elderly patient, which is unilateral, it should alert you. It should alert you. Because blepharitis, even if it is happening in an elderly patient, would mostly be bilateral. Why should a patient have unilateral blepharitis? Why should a patient have unilateral thickening of tarsal plate or skin or something like that? These things always should alert you and prompt you to investigate further and think about other diagnosis than the routine ones that you're used to. So this was a what variant of this was a basal cell carcinoma on biopsy, and this is a particular variant of basal cell carcinoma which is called as morphia form variant, which is something similar to what you see in a sebaceous gland carcinoma pagetoid variant. This is morphia form variant which kind of spreads along the surfaces or it has a wider horizontal spread rather than going in deeply. Normally, basal cell carcinoma tends to go deep and erode deeper. That's why it's called as rodent sulcer, because instead of going horizontally, it tends to go, grow vertically into the depth of the tissue. But morphiform variant will try to spread around and involve a lot of horizontal uh, damage, cause a lot of horizontal damage and invade a lot of soft tissues there. So this was something, this is something different and must be kept in mind, especially when it's a unilateral presentation. Another patient presented as a blepharitis, was being treated as blepharitis and referred as chronic blepharitis. You, you see total loss of eyelashes, total destruction of the lid margin and loss of skin. So this is uh, the, the um, biopsy was done because all these features were suspicious for a malignancy and biopsy came out positive for squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma of the eyelid is the uh, not so common as a sebaceous gland carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma, but once in a while you will still see that. And when you see excoriation of the skin, look at this. Uh, it's a unilateral presentation again. So some things which are common to all these patients are unilateral presentation, loss of lashes, thickening of the lid margin, loss of cilia. All these are particularly common. So nothing more is needed. So on these findings itself, you can you can clinically just make a diagnosis very clearly, and then biopsy is for confirmation of diagnosis and counseling of the patient, right? Another patient who presented with said small mole he had for the last many years, but now it had started growing uh, in the last six months or seven months. It was growing and becoming more darker in color. So again, now you should be suspicious when there is a history in an elderly male, elderly person, male or female, elderly patient, you have a history like this uh, in an elderly age, you have deep dark pigmentation of the skin, which is as per the history, patient was very educated, very alert and giving reliable history, growing in size. So you have to biopsy. And uh, in this particular case, it turned out to be intraepithelial melanoma. Okay. Now, this is what a frank melanoma would look like. Frank melanoma would uh, involve nodularity. Usually it presents with nodularity, thickening of the tissues. In the previous case, there was no nodule. There was no thickening of the tissues here. So this was kind of an in-situ type of picture called also one can use the term melanoma in-situ. And when you have a frank melanoma, then there is involvement of, there may be involvement of contiguous conjunctiva or you have a conjunctival melanoma which spills over to the eyelid. Either way it can go. And the particular feature is deep, dark pigmentation and there is associated nodularity and there is a lot of vascularity also. And sometimes you get these surprises. I'll just share some of these surprises which I did not expect them to be uh, anything mischievous, but they did turn out to be. So this patient presented with history of uh, small collision type lesion on the lower eyelid, which was operated two, three times earlier, but the only now, there was no other clinical feature available here which could suspect a malignancy, which one with which could make one suspect a malignancy. Uh, just that there were some papilliform uh, areas on the lower eyelid, and uh, otherwise nothing else, nothing else. But the only thing positive was that because the patient was in her 60s and the patient was giving history of uh, previous surgery done twice, so that should also alert you. So if there is a recurrent lesion in the eyelid, particularly on the same side, then one should investigate. And then whatever you do, you should send the sample for histopathology. So I send the sample for histopathology as to see what is causing it, whether it was a recurrent collision only or something else is there. And to my surprise, it turned out to be adenoid cystic carcinoma. This we had reported also, uh, this is published, uh, but uh, 
sometimes you have these surprises. So whenever you have anything atypical looking, it's always a good idea to send the sample for histopathology and never miss out on something which may be more uh, sinister. Another patient who was uh, referred to us as a eyelid cyst had some uh, solid cystic mass. It was slightly translucent in areas also, transilluminant in areas also. Some cystic component was also there, but at the same time, some solid component was also there. And you can see some abnormal large feeder vessels also within the substance of the lesion. So again, an elderly patient presenting with some, even the slightest doubt of abnormal blood vessels or history of a rapid growth or history of a prior surgery, you have to be cautious, send the material for histopathology. And this turned out to be a sweat gland carcinoma. Another patient who presented with diffuse, acquired thickening of the periocular tissues, both the eyelids, and uh, been going on and spreading. She also had similar lesions on the abdomen, on the back. And uh, what could this be? Any idea, Shifali, Rolika? Any guesses? So I was also in a situation like yours when I first saw the patient and I was also taken by surprise as to what it is. I had also that time never seen something like this. And, and so, Necrotizing no, fascia it is, sir. No, that is different. That will look completely different. You see, okay. clinically, if you now, retrospectively now, I can notice, you see, it's purplish color. The color is purplish mm -hmm. and it's subcutaneous kind of a, it's a, it's a little deeper to the superficial skin, the lesion, and uh, looks a little vascular. You see, purplish color is become, and look at the, I, I can't move my cursor, I don't know, is there a setting to show you the cursor? I can't, anyways, let it be. So there is some, uh, if you look closely, you would suspect something vascular is going on, because this is all like, so what are the vascular tumors of the eyelid that you know which can, So is it like um, uh, is the patient immunocompromised? Hmm? Is the patient immunocompetent or compromised? Immunocompetent. Hmm. Young patient. She was in her thirties. She was from Afghanistan. <laughs> Can it be a diffuse VLM, sir? But malignant hoga kuch so this turned out to be on, on biopsy to my surprise turned out to be Kapusi. That's what Kapusi, sir. But even with immunocompetent patients, you can still have Kapusis, but yeah. Hmm. yeah. So normally you would suspect immunosuppressed, uh, but she was hmm. thoroughly investigated for any sign of immunosuppression. Uh, hmm. She was no, there was nothing. And, and she had multiple patches like this on the rest of her body as well. Mm -hmm. She responded well to the initial treatment. Uh, treatment was started with doxorubicin. And uh, the lesions regressed quite a bit. I have a photo, not kept it here. I'll have to look for it. But the lesions regressed quite a bit with doxorubicin. When she presented, she was not even able to open her eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, with treatment, she was able to open her eyes completely. But I, uh, long term follow up is not available because the patient flew back to her home country. And came once or twice for follow up. After that, she was lost to follow up. So, usually, prognosis is usually bad for these cases only, especially if they are diffuse and metastatic already by the time. So, so this is uh, was about the clinical uh, presentation and what would, should make us look for a malignancy and uh, suspicious for a malignancy when we are seeing so many patients in the OPD. Patients are coming with a lot of different types of problems. One should keep your eye and mind open uh, for the possibility of these malignant lesions. Also, these are not so uncommon as one would think, as one would think amongst the general public, particularly it's an, it's a, it's a, it's an impression that uh, eye cancer cannot be there. But then you see so many cases like these popping out every day and so not very uncommon. So imaging is usually uh, required if you're suspecting an orbital invasion 
uh, from the lesion, particularly if the idle lesion is located near, near either the medial cancers or the lateral cancers, and you suspect that it could be going into the orbit or invading the lateral rectus muscle or the medial rectus muscle or could have extension into the sac, then you should do an imaging. And then MRI is the imaging of choice. But if your patient cannot afford an MRI, and then you can even do a CT scan and that will also give you enough information about the extent of the disease and this will help you plan your management whether you want to go for a local treatment or, or you want to go for a more extensive kind of a treatment because some orbital structure is involved. Systemic screening uh, should be done as a baseline. Uh, PET CT is the preferred one. At least if PET CT is not available or not affordable, some neck, neck imaging, preferably MRI of the neck, or if, if that also is not uh, possible for a patient, then CT of the neck at least should be done to look for neck lymph nodes. Uh, we'll talk about lymph nodes subsequently. And then uh, for systemic uh, involvement, you should do CT, abdomen, pelvis, and chest. I'm particularly using the word CT and not ultrasound here because Many a times we have seen that ultrasound can miss small metastasis in the liver. So CT is a better modality that way. <laughs> and uh, LFTs, as well to know if there's any metastasis in the liver, which is causing some disturbance in the liver function, although that usually happens very late and for a long time, we will not see any disturbance in the liver function. So yeah, we have this AJCC classification, eight uh, edition now. Uh, which, which can help you to stage your uh, patient into various categories and depending upon the extent of the primary tumor, any involvement of the regional lymph nodes or distant metastasis. So one can go through all these uh, staging parameters in detail and is useful for managing the patients uh, on a follow-up basis. Also, if you are writing a thesis on eyelid malignancies or if you're writing a paper on uh, uh, eyelid malignancies, then it becomes imperative to include uh, AJCC classification, and that will give really some weight to your publication. So, treatment, uh, moving on to treatment, so consideration basically is that uh, we have to reduce the morbidity of the patient, and also at the same time, we need to improve the overall survival. Also, we should, need, we should see the patient in totality, not just the eyelid. So, never treat the Lesion alone. You're not treating the lesion, you're treating the patient. So you have to look at all the factors. Patient's general condition, patient's medical condition, how fit the patient is. The patient is like really frail, really fragile, and you you subject the patient to exenteration or something like that. So you see, you have to think overall on, on terms of how the patient is and where the patient is coming from and what is the patient's expectation. So talk to the patient in detail. Sometimes with increasing volume of patients, we tend to miss out on the patient factor. I would like to just stress about that. We are not treating the lesion. We are treating a patient. So always look into the socioeconomic profile of the patient, from where the patient is coming. Is follow-up possible? Many a times we see patients are like of coexist and being prescribed interferons or chemotherapy uh, because that is being spoken about in conferences, whereas the patient is coming from such far away place that it's not possible for the patient to come for follow-up or the patient is spending a huge amount coming for follow-up. Better to do a surgery in that situation. So you always take a lot of everything into consideration before you plan a treatment. The treatment remains if it's a well-defined lesion, if it's a small lesion, well-defined lesion, then surgical excision is the preferred treatment. But with capital letters, I have written negative margins. That is the most important caveat here, that whenever you are excising a lid malignancy or you are excising a lesion, which you are even suspecting to be a lid malignancy, go wide. So at least four millimeters minimum on either side and subject the margins for histopathology always before you close up this kind of a situation. So you should have negative margins reported on pathology. Otherwise, there is always a higher chance of recurrence and also you can land up in a medical legal mess also. For small lesions, direct closure you can do. If it's a very small lesion, just size the lesion. Lesion is taken out, you send the margins for frozen section. If you have facility, if you don't have frozen section facility, you pass the patient for a couple of days, give a temporary suture and uh, let the permanent section report come before you start reconstruction. In a, in a case where you have a significant uh, suspicion for a malignancy. 
nothing will happen for a few days if you put a temporary uh, tarsorepi kind of a suture from the lower or something like that. You use some meter to close the eyelid temporarily and wait for the permanent section. If you have frozen section, then it is better on. Or you can just start closing the same day. Also. Now this is another example of a smaller lesion where you can exercise direct uh, small uh, wide excision with direct closure type. A slightly larger <clears throat> lesion. So here you have to give a rectangular incision all along it, and then you plan your reconstruction accordingly based on the defect that you get on table. I will not go into so details of reconstruction. Hello. Yeah. What? I think your audio just broke sir in between. No sir. Go it's on fine. sir. It's fine sir. Okay. Okay. So. So obviously, when you are taking out a lesion from the lid with four millimeter on either side, you are bound to get a defect, which may be not a very small one in most cases. And you have to learn your reconstruction techniques also accordingly. So it's kind of a it's a different chapter. Lid reconstruction separate discussion is required for lid reconstruction techniques. But it's always useful to have a knowledge of those before you start treating these lesions because you will have to use some sort of Technique here. In this particular case, a huge slap was used for tarsogenic type of huge slap for posterior lamella, and the patient's own skin tissue was advanced for the anterior lamella from the lower eyelid. <clears throat> this is a patient with the same patient we saw for squamous cell carcinoma, and it end to end excision was done. Medial cancer is gone, lateral cancer is gone. It's a larger defect, and uh, periosteal flaps were raised from either side. and uh, this patient, a reverse cutler beard surgery was done for this patient. A tarsocanic devil flap for the posterior lamella and skin muscle flap from the upper lid itself. A reverse cutler beard surgery was done. The patient was doing well subsequently. But unfortunately, after a few years, uh, she developed hepatic metastasis. Even we had screened her, we were annually screening her, and nothing was there. Uh, but after, I think, uh, five years of her, Three or four years of a treatment to come to hepatic metastasis. So sometimes when you see this patient who's got a extensive lesion from um, like this patient had medial cancers to lateral cancers, they may have microscopic metastasis in the blood, which may get lodged in the liver or different sites and may not be picked up initially. They may lie dormant for some time. Particularly happens with melanomas, but in this particular case, uh, even squamous cell carcinoma uh, presented that. Way. So ultimately, cosmetically, it was fine, but not a, a good outcome in terms of life. So what is important here is margins. So what happens is many a times, what I've seen is that surgeons excise the entire lid and then leave it to pathologists to take out the margins and report on the margin. Now, that is not a good way, I would say, because many a time you would be sending a report uh, sending the sample to a pathologist who is more used to seeing bigger samples, a general pathologist. And for them, this is a very small sample, frankly. And they will may not be able to, to take the samples as per your requirements also. Uh, they are not oriented in ophthalmic pathology. So what is best is that you take out uh, these sample, these margins yourself. So go beyond your uh, margins of excision and take out uh, lateral margin, medial margin, and excise one or two millimeter more of the separate uh, layer of the tissues where you spread the tumor could be also all around. Basically, you need complete margin. And then you have to draw it. You have to draw it on the uh, on your pathology sheet, the requisition that you're sending to the pathologist so that the pathologist also knows and sees your drawing and sees that uh, what you are actually sending. And then he will be able to give you a much better report. And Always discuss the reports with the pathologist. Better interaction you have with your pathologist, the more you will learn every time. So I send all these patients with a diagram with all the margins labeled. And after that, when the report comes for a malignancy, always, uh, always me and my pathologist will have a word about the patient, will have a word about the margins and confirm that everything is in order. So once you have the negative margin, Report, then only you should plan your reconstruction and never before that. Many a times you, you are in a hurry and you close the lesion, you, you do your excellent reconstruction and ultimately some margin comes positive 
subsequently in the report after one week, 10 days, and then you are stuck. What to do now? You've done your reconstruction also. So what now? Again, you have to go back. You have to do your excision again. And now this time you infiltrated the other lower eyelid or the upper eyelid from where you've taken the flap also. So this is something which uh, has a role in particular in patients like these, where you have vegetative sebaceous gland carcinoma, as I mentioned earlier, these patients can sometimes have a diffuse involvement of the ocular surface as well. And there can be steep areas, there can be microscopic areas of uh, malignancy, which are seeded onto different, different areas of the uh, conjunctiva. So in cases like these, where you suspect a vegetoid invasion, uh, you should take small, small bits. It's like two to three millimeter tissue bits from 18 to 20 different, different sites from wherever you can take these uh, as mark in this uh, picture. And then again, draw this on a filter paper, place the tissue bits over your drawing, draw a similar pattern on your pathology requisition sheet, and then send and label properly each and every site, number it properly, and then you send it to your pathologist. So that after you get your complete report, you should know exactly where the tumor is present, exactly where there is no tumor. Because if pegetoid invasion is present on the surface, then your management completely changes. Then instead of local excision, you will have to resort to an exenteration. And if the patient is not fit for exenteration, then you have other options like mitomycin C and other things, but not very effective. Exenteration is still the treatment of choice for the pegetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma. So if you have a patient who presents late and has orbital involvement, which can be seen in uh, about 6 to 17 percent of patients with high lead tumors, then obviously you will require orbital exenteration. And uh, preferably, again, use margin clearance on all sides. Any of the margins is positive or it's an extensive disease, go for post-operative radiotherapy as well. Fortunately, nowadays we are resorting to lid skin sparing techniques for exenteration, which give a much better cosmesis, a much better orbital prosthesis uh, fabrication is nowadays possible for these patients don't have to go around uh, with their dis disfigured eyes and uh, they can have a much normal uh, lifestyle even after surgery. Now, something uh, which is coming up in future, may we may see better advances in the coming few years, new attribute chemotherapy in sebaceous gland carcinoma for, of the eyelid, what it does basically is with chemotherapy, you're downstaging the disease. So if a tumor is very extensive and you would think that the surgery would be very mutilating for the patient and would be more morbid than the tumor itself initially. So then you, you give some new adjuvant therapy and you shrink the tumor. And once the tumor is shrunken, smaller in size, then you can do a, a smaller surgery. And sometimes in such situations, if the muscle is involved, you, you and you were thinking of an orbital exenteration. In those cases, you can actually make the tumor smaller, resect the tumor, and subsequently give some radiotherapy to the orbit as well, and save the eye also. Those cases are also uh, uh, are reported. And with new adjuvant chemotherapy in an extensive disease, you're also somewhere tackling microscopic metastasis and probably reducing the uh, incidence of metastasis, although that is still debatable. So what is used commonly is carboplatinin 5-FU, which, which was published first by Dr. Murthy and Dr. Hanavar only. And uh, you know, this is one example of uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy being given for a patient with a large eyelid species and uh, extending up to the lateral tensors. So you can see that after three cycles of chemotherapy, the tumor has shrunk significantly. And this time it was uh, removed locally with surgical excision and subsequent reconstruction and radiotherapy to so treat patients with going. So what to do if you have a basal cell carcinoma? That chemotherapy thing works for sebaceous gland carcinoma. What do, you, what do you do for such an extensive basal cell carcinoma, which is not even orbital, but extending to the cheek area as well, uh, going beyond the orbits? Or this patient who had a multifocal basal cell carcinoma and involving the eye, the eyelids, the, the muscles of going into the orbit, as well as extending to the face, cheek, forehead, everywhere. What do you do in these cases? So one option is, of course, exenteration and do a complete excision. We would require a team of uh, 
a plastic surgeon or a head and neck surgeon along with you and you do the exaggeration and they take out the other parts and then you need to have a good setup where there is blood transfusion there is an icu facility because it becomes a really major surgery and reconstruction also can be done spread thickness skin grafts uh, in such cases other option is vismodigimid uh, vismodigimid which is like a hedgehog pathway in itself and it's a, it's a it's a little expensive treatment not very commonly used in india still because of the cost factor and also patient has to take this capsule lifelong and the moment the patient uh, stops taking this then uh, the tumor tends to come back uh, but it's particularly useful in patients with multifocal basal cell carcinoma quite uh, response rate is quite good but only thing is high cost maybe in future we'll have a lower cost hospitalization and uh, or something similar some molecule which will help us to treat these multifocal large advanced basal cell carcinomas in a better way with less mutilating procedures uh, if you have a small superficial basal cell carcinoma patient presents rarely early to you then one modality can be imiquimod ointment so is an ointment which you can apply on the lesion and it has about 60 to 75% efficacy to reduce very superficial small basal cell carcinoma lesion uh that is something which can be tried and some other molecules target therapies are being investigated and coming up for squamous cell carcinoma as well but nothing solid uh, which we can use in our practice routinely so far We're still waiting for something like that so hopefully in the next few years we'll get many more molecules and a combination of chemo surgery like we do for many of the orbital tumors so something more will come up for oil tumors as well and we'll have more options and more economically cost effective options last section is devoted to lymph nodes so your treatment for oil tumors would be incomplete if you ignore your lymph nodes so always uh, you have a patient with an eyelid or nodule malignancy it should become a habit only you have an eyelid malignancy your hand should automatically go to the patient's lymph nodes after a few patients you will you should have it should become a reflex whether it's an ossn or it's an eyelid malignancy because lymphatics you know can drain to preauricular nodes anterior cervical nodes or submental or submandibular nodes so all these areas you should palpate whenever the patient presents to you the so first thing is the clinical examination itself uh, the second thing would be in imaging for the node if it's a large lesion in a very small lesion every time i don't separately image the nodes but uh, a routine pet scan should be done as a baseline in all patients that's what i would say uh, but if you have a palpable node then uh, you have to manage them differently along with the next surgeon so as you can see from this uh, chart you, the lymph node metastasis rate ranges from 0.03% up to 40% in melanomas and most common with melanomas and the second most common with uh sebaceous lung carcinoma sebaceous lung carcinoma actually is the most common uh, tumor in our country and many a times we have seen it to be a very notorious one it's not that easy uh even though it's a very common tumor but many times it has skip areas many times you will have a uh, lymph node metastasis so always palpate and if you do find a palpable lymph node always subject that patient to further investigation take uh, help from a head and neck onco surgeon and you have to completely treat the patient you have to remove the tumor preferably in the same sitting the the next surgeon should remove the lymph nodes and then subsequent radiation of the lymph node bed has to be given to complete your treatment another technique is sentinel node biopsy to pick up the micrometastasis in the lymph nodes when at a stage when it's still not uh, clinically evident this was one patient i did many years back uh, patient had melanoma and uh, but again there there are positives and negatives for sentinel node biopsy it's not a full proof technique over time we have seen a lot of uh, cases still having metastasis in spite of doing everything even if you do sentinel node biopsy and everything so there is a lot of this thing but you what you do basically is that you're trying to catch the first node where the metastasis can happen so you you're trying to catch the first draining node so you inject a dye near the tumor the dye goes to the first node you open that up you remove that lymph node send that for frozen section and if it is positive then you go on to the next level of lymph nodes 
and then if the next level of lymph node is positive again you go to the next level so in the neck uh, there are different levels the lymph nodes are divided by different levels 1 2 3 4 5 6 types these are like pockets of where you are you having lymph nodes so if one level has is having positivity then you go to the next level till the time your lymph nodes and proton section are negative and then if they are negative then you stop so basically this is a technique to pick up micrometastases or of the involved lymph nodes at the, at the early stage even before it becomes palpable but it requires obviously it requires a proper infrastructure where you can uh, do such kind of things and uh, particularly important for melanomas even it's uh, recommended for sebaceous and carcinomas but the availability of infrastructure and uh, and then of course the utility utility is not really really established it's not really cool proof thing to eliminate chance of metastasis overall life survival does it make a difference or not that is still debatable so so to summarize here most important thing would be to identify these tumors at an early stage by recognizing some of the clinical features that we discussed all along and if you can see any of those any of the lesions that you see in the in your opd uh, coming with some flash loss some vascularity some destruction of margin or all those things which we discussed so just keep an eye open keep your mind open and identify early so that is the most important thing that you can do for a patient second thing is size the lesion completely by complete excision means on histopathology you should have negative margin and it should not be a subjective excision so always send separate margins for histopathology and should have a reported negative margin before you start closing up the case third is do not ignore lymph nodes your exam, your your management for the patient would be incomplete if you ignore lymph nodes as significant number of these patients can have lymph node positivity and then use a juvent treatment like radiotherapy chemotherapy wherever necessary take the help of neck surgeons take the help of your colleagues uh, head and neck surgeon and and make a good rapport and make a good team around you and that will really improve the success rate of your uh, your treatment thank you so much thank you so much sir for that very very comprehensive lecture i think the topic is vast but you showed like cases and it kept it very practical so thank you so much for that uh we have like a few i have a question sir on the case that you showed for kaposi sarcoma how did you go about taking the biopsy sir are they these tumors very vascular they bleed like how did yeah, you yeah they do bleed but uh, it was like a a, a provage biopsy like you take with basal cell carcinoma you take some normal skin and you take a include a part of your uh, tumor in that but if you cauterize well then it will be in and so in immunocompromised individuals if we give heart therapy kaposi's show yes. yes yes in, in, in immunocompromised even heart therapy sufficient is sufficient nothing yes. else will be required unless it's a very diffuse issue like in this patient she was not immunocompromised but she had already systemic metastasis at the time of her presentation where it's a different case a simple small nodule with no other systemic manifestation and simply heart therapy also can help to resolve these issues right so uh, another question is that how often do you get uh, surgical surprises like uh, in any of your patients that when you're suspecting say for example uh, like uh, like a lid lid mass per se which you were expecting to be like maybe a, a squamous cell carcinoma but turned out to be a sweat gland carcinoma as you've shown in one of the cases so how often do you see these uh, surgical surprises which are proven on histopathology the term surprise itself says that it is not very common <laughs> that is true sir that is true uh, in most of these lesions fortunately follow a pattern and uh, you get what you expect most of the time i would say 95% of the time what you are expecting the report also says the same thing uh, but just one or two percent cases may be, may turn out to be something like a weird kind of a, a tumor or a rare kind of a tumor which we have not commonly heard of but that's rare but that is the advantage of relying on the pathologist so wherever you have even the slightest of suspicion keep a low threshold for sending the samples to for biopsy even doesn't matter if it comes as a typogranulomatous inflammation or something like that doesn't matter but 
should not miss out on uh, anything which is sinister, especially if you have slight suspicion. Keep a low threshold and make friends with your pathologist. Right, sir. So there was a a, a, a question, sir, that uh, sentinel lymph node uh, resection. So this was a practice which was followed long back that uh, in any of the orbital malignancies, they would do primary sentinel lymph node resection. So a question has been asked that how, uh, how often is it done now and what is the role? Um, is, is there any proven role for the same? See, it's again a controversial thing. It's, it's a controversial thing, so particularly in melanomas. Uh, it is still uh, being done for any melanoma. Recommendation is more than 2 millimeters. You should do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. But for other lesions, it is not so commonly done. See, the reason being, uh, sometimes these, you may still miss out. You may still miss out because of the presence of skip lesions, particularly in sebaceous and carcinoma. You can have some area which is clear and then you can have a skip lesion. So you may miss out even on sentinel lymph node biopsy. And uh, otherwise, you may even have a hematogenous spread also. So you are going to miss out on that also. If there is a hematogenous spread, you can't do anything. If your sentinel lymph node biopsy is negative, you'll be very happy that, oh, I've done everything, but then there will be some focus in the liver. So it's not a foolproof way also. There is cost involved. There is requirement of an infrastructure which is not available so easily. And really, is it adding to the overall survival of the patient? That is debatable. Uh, it's not done very commonly. For melanomas, yes, I would say you should do everything. It's really a very notorious tumor. So for every tumor, you should do whatever you can do best. But central lymph node actually mainly is recommended for melanoma. and carcinoma, I, I don't think many people are doing it. Although there are in the, some in literature, some, some literature is there that you should do it for sebaceous and carcinoma also. But you have to see where it is available and how feasible it is. In a setup like that, country like that. Right, sir. So there's one more question, then that is about that. Uh, uh, in cases with the diffuse uh, OS, uh, sorry, diffuse SDCA, as you have shown. Um, so, uh, what is the role of uh, new adjuvant chemo radiation, if any? Diffuse means vegetoid. I'm taking it. Right, no, it in pagetoid exenteration is a better. And, sorry, sir. In pagetoid exenteration is a better. Right, sir. But uh, is there any role of neoadjuvant chemo radiation in in? Not in pagetoid. Not, not in pagetoid. In, not in so and in basal, sir. If it's a if it's a localized large mass, which you want to shrink before you go in for your surgery, localized surgery, map biopsy is negative, and you just want to do a local resection. It's a large mass. You want to shrink it a little bit. Then for three cycles or four cycles, you can do chemo, shrink it up a little bit so that you can proceed with your surgery with less mutilation. But in a diffuse situation, where the term diffuse is used, it means more than 50% of the surface is gone. So in those cases, exenteration is a better option. Right, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you for sparing out your time. Thank you. Very and much. Thank you. Uh, we do understand that you've made your time even when you're traveling. So thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much, Rilika. I hope it was of some use. Yes, okay. sir. Indeed. Okay. Uh, we landed up learning a lot of things. And uh, uh, it's uh, more of a, like fellows as well. So for us, from our side, it's all, also we thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. And, and next week is going to be a recess. Uh, for uh, the uh, AIOS sessions. And so we'll see you after that. Thank you everyone for being coming online.